hello everyone greetings and uh, welcome to the 47th session of the online optom learning series so let me introduce to you our speaker for today uh, today we have dr jamil rizwana hussain din i would call her dr rizwana if she doesn't mind and dr rizwana yeah, needs uh, yeah dr rizwana actually needs no introduction to uh not only to indian optometrists but uh, people who are into binocular vision i think globally uh, she currently heads the binocular vision vision therapy clinic at the shankar netralaya eye hospital chennai she is also the assistant professor at the elite school of optometry and she is the first clinical diplomat from india in the section of binocular vision perception and pediatric optometry from the american academy of optometry aao she is also the inaugural president of the aao indian chapter she is a renowned optometrist as we all know and she receives referrals for patients across the country for her clinical expertise in amblyopia binocular vision vision anomalies and managing children with learning visual related issues she is also a committee member of the government of india's initiative in the preparation of a manual of vision assessment and rehabilitation of cerebral visual impairment kids and she also serves as a trainer for that particular category she has been involved in a lot of school eye health initiatives for over a decade and her doctoral research was to understand the binocular vision anomalies among school children and she is currently a part of a large epidemiological project to understand the prevalence and risk factors of myopia the onset of myopia and the progression among school children she has numerous publications in peer reviewed journals and also has few authored chapters in books she is also the reviewer of national as well as international peer reviewed journals and a lot of them to be named but a few are optometry and vision science uh, british medical journal and indian journal of ophthalmology there are a lot but these are the three main ones what i could pick here and today she is uh, talking to us about the digital eye strain which is i think everybody is eagerly waiting for as i see the chat across so welcome rizwana ma'am and uh, i would leave the screen time to you now thank you uh, fakradeen that was indeed a very very uh, Sort of, I felt very humbled and honored by your introduction. So, without further ado, let me just begin the begin the topic for today, which is, as you said, digital eye strain. So, before I uh, begin, I just want to uh, you know make sure that I don't have any financial uh, or any sort of disclosures, and uh, this is the sort of first presentation that I'm making after we lost our beloved uh, beloved friend and. a uh, colleague dr rajeshwari mahadevan so i would like to sort of dedicate uh, uh, this talk to her uh, and request all of you to extend your prayers uh, to uh, the bereaved family members okay so with that uh, the overview of today's presentation is this which is first of all why are we speaking this now uh, it's it's quite logical uh, for you to you know kind of understand why we are speaking digital eye strain now but still i will give you some statistics and what is the current understanding of digital eye strain and then there are other things that we will go through as we go you know through the presentation so fakrudin i request you to share that survey form in the link so i request all the participants here to just take like you know a minute uh, to open that link that's being shared in the chat box uh it, it's not going to take you more than 20 seconds to fill that form uh it's all sort of closed ended questions like three or four questions uh basically the uh, i'll tell you like you know towards the end of this presentation uh you know sort of give you some insights striking insights into uh, uh what we are going to be uh, learning from this survey that i'm running right right now okay so it's basically to understand the i care professionals that all of us who joined for this meeting whom we call as ccps our perspective on uh, digital eye strain and uh, computer vision syndrome 
So basically, we are the IK providers, but what is our level of self-care when it comes to digital ice cream? That's the whole sort of uh, perspective with which I've just put forth this questionnaire. Uh, so just please cooperate with me uh, and stay with me throughout. Uh, so just take your time and fill that questionnaire. So, you know, in the next, uh, we'll wait for about, as I go through this presentation in about 10 minutes, we'll close that survey. So just, you know, you can keep filling that questionnaire as we go through the presentation. Uh, so thanks to Fakhreddin for sort of choosing this topic because it kind of allowed me to uh, go back and read a lot of literature. And it was quite surprising to see the sort of literature that exists in this field because you know all of us were aware of this word as you see here computer vision syndrome so this is the this is the sort of paper cut uh, i think that came out in the 1990 1993 94 uh, 1993 94 uh, uh, you know new york times thought so where it talks about uh, vdt vision problems may affect 10 million and so of course professor james shidi who was the pioneer in this field, he had re he had released a study uh, who was heading the VDT eye clinic at the University of California, Berkeley that time. So he had just surveyed about 1,000 odd optometrists nationwide and found that 14 percentage of the patients had symptoms related to, uh, you know, what we call as the uh, uh, visual display terminal use. OK, so computers were called as DDTs. And that's the time like when the computers were introduced in the market. So everybody was talking about computers, computers. And uh, and imagine this, OK, the beginning of 1990s. Look at this this paper cut that speaks about UV 100 coating for eyeglasses that came out at that time, the glare filters for the monitors that came out at that time. And some company was sued because they were making false claims uh, like, you know, called sore eyes, sight for sore eyes, like unsubstantiated claims about, uh, you know, UV filter glasses. So the situation hasn't changed much over the last uh, uh, 20 odd years, 30 odd years. In fact, three decades have gone, uh, but the situation hasn't changed much. But this is how it all began. And, and a lot of it should be owed to people like Professor James Sheedy. And then look at this June 1994 in the Information Today paper. Uh, then people are coming out with the uh, filters for CRT, the cathode ray tube monitors that, you know, we had this box sort of thing, uh, which the participants today, if you ask your mom that, they will tell you. And uh, even the sort of keyboard, look at this keyboard that's, that's called as the low cost ergonomic keyboard. So, of course, you know, the world has moved much, but the sort of complaints uh, remain the same. And now, why are we speaking about it right now? So this is the this is the sort of statistics that came out at the beginning of lockdown, uh, which sort of you know the the title was kids daily screen time surges during coronavirus. So if you really look at the tablet, the use of the handheld tablet devices like went off shoot uh, like shot like that, and then the phones of course did increase a little bit and desktop computers also in, increased a little bit. And uh, so the tablet traffic has nearly tripled and the phone traffic nearly doubled. That's what this paper cut uh, sort of says. And then what so this is what the so this is what is the Indian data that says that, uh, uh, you know, by the Nielsen and the Broadcast uh, Audience Research Council, the Bar Council, uh, again, I think by May, they, they uh, sort of released this notice that's, that said that uh, almost every second, uh, some Indian is now on Internet. OK, and all across India, 40 percentage penetration has happened uh, and the individual, the, the age is about 12 years and above. And uh, and of course, urban is 54 percent and rural is 32 percent so sort of like the use of digital devices searched uh, post COVID-19 for sure and uh, so this is an editorial that uh, we sort of released uh, in this uh, edition of the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology so you can go and access it for free where we saw uh, some of the predictions that we have of course there's no scientific evidence at this moment but it's all logical predictions and what an eye care practitioner need to be aware of in terms of being able to manage the myopia epidemic and digitalized strain in the post COVID-19 era. So you can just go and access this and some of this is what I'm going to cover today. 
and uh, and then again you know this uh, uh, so again uh, this is from the united states where uh, uh, the use of devices among kids is increasing during the lockdown and where what are the long term effects where people sort of say yes myopia uh, search could happen so so the sort of uh, you know hypothesis that we all have as eye care practitioners uh, sort of remain the same though we don't have any evidence at this moment uh, so i'm just trying to give you a perspective of you know why we are talking about this topic and what is the importance of this topic and uh, so this is a study that uh, sort of you know came even before the covid-19 uh, period where uh, smartphone excessive smartphone usage was shown to be a risk factor for uh, diplopia like in uh, you know 12 patients Uh, were included in this uh, in the next study that I'm going to talk about. So in this study, they just had three cases where uh, you know all the three children had sort of diplopia after excessive mobile phone usage. And uh, this is a study where uh, you know twelve patients uh, were uh, included, and all these twelve patients had what we call as acute acquired competent esotropia associated with excessive smartphone use. Of course, there are no uh you know sort of well controlled or well uh, you know a large sample size uh, based clinical trials that are available current uh, currently which uh, uh you know can show us the cause and effect but all these sort of point out to the fact that there is some association that exists between uh, uh you know eye strain digital eye strain and uh, smartphones so basically for those who have heard this term digital eye the term computer vision syndrome so the term computer vision syndrome it's, it's that's what has been widely used but then why do we use the word digitalized strain and uh, it, it both means the same they don't mean anything different uh, they just indicate a group of ocular and non ocular symptoms among the users of any sort of visual display units basically uh, be it your laptop personal computer your mobile phone or any sort of even your virtual reality headsets so whatever digital device that you use any sort of uh, ocular symptoms or non ocular symptoms that you develop because of these uh, uh, digital device use is called digital eye strain and uh, the threshold that when i looked at various papers they say that the so you know the symptoms start roughly at about 4 hours and beyond and why do we have to bother about this is basically because it's got a tremendous impact on the quality of life and the occupational productivity because about 64 to 90 percentage of computer users experience some sort of symptoms related to digitalized strain and computer vision syndrome okay so uh, you know this is uh, uh, this this is all the prevalence data that i sort of picked up from various sources so this is uh, an interesting study that came from chennai among uh, medical and engineering students which says that the prevalence of cvs was found to be 81.9 percentage okay uh, among engineering students among medical students it's 78.6 percentage so huge huge so uh, almost 7 to nine people out of so out of every 10 subjects that you are going to examine seven to nine of them are going to have some sort of uh, computer vision syndrome related issues and uh, three fourth of these students complained of any one of the symptoms so this is this is how huge the burden of computer vision syndrome is again another recent study from uh, saudi arabia also showed that uh, in uh, you know in participants whose median age is about 20 years uh, whose most common use device was mobile phone almost 97.3 percentage Uh, of the study participants had at least one symptom of CVS. I was just trying to look at one or the other, and though the earlier literature sorts of says that it ranges anywhere between 60 to 90 percentage, some of the recent data is sort of showing up like a really a huge percentage. And these are the sort of symptoms that these people, uh, you know, reported. And the top ones are like headache or some sort of issues with the eyesight, itching eyes, and burning sensation. So the the burning sensation and the you know sort of dry eye related uh, issues also sort of pop up in every of the computer vision syndrome issue that we will see as we go through this presentation 
And uh, uh, this is a recent study that came out in 2020. Uh, and then I was surprised to see that there are many studies in the field of radiology because as you could imagine, for us, you know, it's all either educational purpose or recreational purpose. But then for radiologists, that's what is the profession all about, where their sort of digital device use, as you could see, is, you know, putting these uh, uh, radiographic images one after another and then looking at it. So uh, the sort of burnout uh, due to digitalized train is reportedly uh, very huge among uh, radiologists. And then most participants tend to spend about seven to nine hours daily reviewing the medical images and about 50%, about 25.3 percentage of them just take only one break uh, in the whole day. And, uh, you know, that was something uh, that I found to be, that I found kind of very, uh, you know, I felt I felt uh, sorry for that in the sense uh, that they kind of like have very very much burnouts uh, because they have to kind of extensively view these images one after another. Now, imagine this post-COVID-19 period where all these sorts of uh, sorts of professionals are involved in the front line. Imagine the sort of ice strain that they will have. So that's why I put this study. And uh, uh, this is a data that's compiled from 2016. So the, the question now is, what is so different when we are thinking of digital devices like a mobile phone or a smartphone use compared to, uh, you know, a computer use or reading from the textbook? So there are some sort of uh, discussion going on, like is, is reading on a computer screen or a digital device, is it the same uh, compared to reading it on a hard copy or a book? And this has more implications, especially for children, if you would uh, imagine uh, that, you know, the sort of educational system has in has you know moved more towards digital medium now and the virtual classrooms have taken up a huge space so we so I, I was interested to see like you know so what is the sort of visual implications of digital device use especially in children and this was a very interesting study where a pretty much large number of children like in the age group of 11 to 17 years were, were included and in india this, this study was carried out in china so about 576 children, adolescent children were in, included in the study. And what they found was that, uh, of course, digital eye strain was predominant. But uh, uh, if you really look at this very closely, across the age, leave the 17 years because they didn't have much subjects in that uh, age group. But 11 to 16 years, uh, the sort of uh, uh, the working distance, OK, uh, kind of uh, decrease uh, as the age increases and uh, what is even more relevant is that this is book and this is the digital device more children sort of like as the age increases children tend to move to digital devices move from uh, you know reading textbooks to digital devices so if you see the percentage they saw they sort of shift from a higher percentage in the lower age group to higher percentage uh, uh, to digital devices in the higher age group so that is how digital devices are occupying the space even for educational purposes uh, among children and it is associated with a much more closer working distance compared to uh, reading from a textbook uh, or anything that is hard copy like a uh, you know text and now moving on to the symptomatology okay because uh, it's very important that we understand uh, so okay now we understand digitalized train is not just to do with computers it is it has also to do with mobile phones and any sort of digital devices okay uh, so what sort of symptoms do these patients present with okay so uh, it could be categorized broadly under two groups which is the vision related uh, symptoms or ocular surface related symptoms so earlier we would uh, call this internal uh, symptoms or external symptoms in fact uh, some of the earlier studies done by shady and gauri shankaran et al so they would classify it as uh, you know internal symptoms external symptoms oculomotor related symptoms uh, and sort of dry related symptoms or economic musculoskeletal symptoms okay but broadly if you if you if you want to put everything under two categories then uh, the current uh, uh, review by brennan uh, calls brennan et al sort of puts it under two major categories one is vision related the other is ocular surface related so all of our uh, discussion is going to revolve around these two so i would request that you remember these two broader categories okay so what really comes under vision related so as you know the term vision suggests anything that's going to have an impact on vision Vision per se, 
uh, in terms of refractive errors uh, that includes astigmatism or presbyopia and especially in digital device users what is more relevant is the amount of astigmatism that can impact the uh, you know sort of visual comfort so people say even low levels of astigmatism as low as 0.75 diopters can actually impact the visual comfort and this has uh, great implications in uh, contact lens practice because uh, when we want to fit contact lenses many times we would go with fitting the uh, you know spherical lenses uh, with the spherical equivalent but we could advise that uh, especially when uh, right now everybody is a digital device user right so it's it's important that we uh, think about uh, moving to toric lenses or at least look at the sort of visual comfort that people have with toric lenses with the uh, accurate astigmatic correction and not just go with the uh, spherical equivalent value in spherical contact lenses because uh, a very low astigmatism also can impact the discomfort visual discomfort uh, levels of people who are vulnerable to digital eye strain so that's the refractive thing which could, uh, which as you see here could be because of uh, sort of refractive error related uh, or in, uh, or due to accommodation issues so as you know that uh, Uh, when the digital device changes, like when we move from bigger screens to smaller screens, uh, the pixels of the the pixelation of the target changes, and uh, it also induces increased accommodative effort and increased convergence effort as the viewing distance becomes smaller, becomes lesser. And this can lead to complaints like blurred vision, diplopia, tired eyes. Uh, dryness of eyes heaviness and headaches okay and then ocular motor so ocular motor is basically nothing but anything to do with binocular vision related issues that's got to do with your fovea status your versions and accommodation status and the because you've been constantly staring at the monitor it can also uh, affect your pupillary reaction in the long run okay and so we need to look at uh, ocular motor parameters understand convergence accommodation lag and there are certain other technical terms which i'm not going to jump uh, right now but if you are interested we can discuss later uh, but for a sort of uh, you know clarity that i want to give it's important that we do a basic binocular vision assessment which includes uh, testing for convergence and accommodation and of course the sort of complaints that these two groups would give is more or less the same okay they going to say blurred vision headache double vision tired eyes and focusing difficulty now moving on to ocular surface related issues which is uh, anything to do with the dry eye dry eye related issues and of course you know uh, what is shown is that when we use a digital device we sort of uh, not just the blinking rate reduces but the uh, uh, completeness of the blink also gets affected so what do i mean the completeness of the blink is that when the upper eyelid sort of comes down and closes and touches the lower eyelid will make a, a complete uh, eyelid closure uh, but uh, when we when we have an increased cognitive load or when we are staring at the monitor we just kind of forget to blink or we make incomplete blinks and this is what leads to uh, uh, you know evaporation of the tears from the ocular surface leading to uneven tear distribution unstable and thin tear films and uh, if if there is an associated pathology of course dry eye is a vast topic in itself if there are other associated pathologies which are to do with uh, uh, you know hormonal changes or an immune system dysfunction like the jogren syndrome that could be an autoimmune disorder like jogren that's present or any other sort of ocular pathology that's already present can aggravate ocular surface related issues and this can cause all sort of dryness related issues including glare so this is the two major categories or the symptoms metallic and uh, uh, so this is a study that uh, kind of looked at the, the percentage of incomplete blinks and look at the, look at this this is basically uh, you know you have your uh, you have your text here uh, downstairs down below and you have your uh, tablet and personal computer up okay so if you really look at the percentage of incomplete blinks they are much higher Uh, when we view, uh, you know, when we view a personal computer or a digital device, to do text, okay? So compared to a text that is uh, printed and then you are going to read it aloud. So, so this is what uh, is the impact of uh, uh, blinking and uh, and its impact on tear film stability. 
and uh, so what is really the difference between uh, you know handheld devices personal computers uh, and your know, ocular surface related issues so as you see here this is uh, this is the same paper that i'm discussing you can go and read this paper it's a brilliant paper by Coles Brennan where he talks about the symptomatology and management of digital eye strain where what really happens with handheld devices is that as we just discussed the working distance comes down, the font size, of course, becomes much smaller, and that increases the accommodation demand and uh, the sort of uh, strain that, that's being put on the orbicularis oculae muscle because of the squinting and the squeezing that we do, and uh, which also increases the blood flow. So this is what is, uh, you know, uh, sort of compiled the literature uh, from various studies as what really happens when somebody uses a handheld device. And this blue light sort, I'll come back to it again. Uh, but again, this blue light comes both from handheld devices and personal computers. But handheld devices, of course, a little bit more, especially if we are looking at LED-based monitors and stuff like that, where uh, you know the blue light can have an impact on circadian rhythms. And there are studies that says uh, animal uh, studies that talks about retinal cell damage and stuff like that. And this could lead to you know glare or heaviness in the short term. And then long-term, uh, this long-term extrapolation says that it could be risk. It could put the person at risk for AMD or retinopathy or glaucomatous RNFL damage. Okay, so this is what is the sort of uh, uh, the hypothesis that people are uh, making from uh, what sort of visual issues can come from handheld and. Per now, moving on to the next important component of the whole process, which is ergonomic concerns. Of course, uh, you know, I did not look into the ergonomic literature as such, but looking into optometric literature, uh, there is not even one paper that, uh, uh, that disregards this aspect of ergonomic issues, which is the muscle strain that is showing up on your face and the sort of pain that can show up on your neck and shoulders and back pain and issues like that. And, uh, you know, uh, there are also a lot of hypotheses that is made about cervical issues and accommodation issues and stuff like that, which I will come uh, come to it quickly. And now that uh, uh, we are having, all of us are having what we call as like multiple device uses. None of us use one device, right? So we use multiple devices. We keep shifting between devices. And so this is all becoming even more relevant. And this is the same thing that we just discussed before when it comes to blinking and contact lens wear is definitely, uh, you know, affects uh, uh, blinking rate uh, much more compared to spectacle wear. So the, the issues with digital eye strain is more higher among contact lens users. Uh, so moving from single uh, monitors, we are doing what we call as dual or triple screening right now, and this is becoming even more relevant. So what are the causes? So yes, we have these symptoms, like, you know, all these symptoms, vision related, ocular motor related, dryness related. So what are the causes for these issues? So any sort of uncorrected refractive error, any sort of uncorrected refractive error, as I told before, even lower amounts of astigmatism can cause significant vision related issues. And any sort of virgins and accommodation issues can add to this, okay? And dry eye related issues and uh, your posture, your overall posture, and more importantly, the humidity of the environment. So there are certain studies that have given humidity recommendations. Uh, so if you have a, a you know an air conditioner where or a humidity controller where you can mon monitor the humidity of the environment, then it can play a huge role in uh, you know, reducing the ocular surface related issues. And uh, ambient lighting, okay? So they say that uh, uh, about uh, 500, minimum 500 lux, okay? So they say that 500 lux is the ambient illumination that is recommended for anybody who uses a digital device. But then studies also say that many people tend to use now uh, nowadays under completely like room lights off. Like when, when you use a digital device, like before you sleep, and then the small screen and all these stuff. So, uh, laptop and desktop computer use, like, is there any difference? Because uh, now that work from home has kind of uh, made us to, you know, use whatever device that we have at home. But of course, laptop uses because of the change in the screen size, uh, the change in the viewing angle. And uh, uh, these are the two main reasons. Uh, they say that laptop users experienced more complaints than desktop users, not just vision-related complaints, but especially neck pain. 80% uh, of people who use laptops have neck pain compared to just 50% of 
of people who use desktop computers. So the, this, the, the key message is that what is more important in management of digital lifestyle is not just to look at the visual component of your patient, but also pay attention to the uh, musculoskeletal issues of, uh, of people so that you're able to you know, give a, a more holistic approach to the management process. And this was a well-conducted study where, you know, of course, 30 healthy volunteers, they were uh, given a printed book and then an electronic book. And then they were, uh, their tear film changes and ocular symptoms were, were uh, assessed, okay? So look at this, what it says that these are the common symptoms, okay? Irritation, blurred vision, dryness, burning symptoms, tearing, eye strain, headache. So what really happens uh, when you read a e-book, okay? So baseline assessment is done okay so if you are the subject uh, baseline assessment is done then you're given the task you have to read for 20 minutes then again uh, your tear film uh, measurements are done uh, beginning from tear meniscus height to tear breakup time uh, your shermer's test so all the tear uh, uh, evaluation is done okay with your ebook and then with your uh, regular printed book and what is really uh, interesting in this study is that before and after reading in the same group, an increase in all the symptoms, okay, not just one symptom, an increase in all the symptoms were uh, seen with the ebook based uh, reading. And uh, of course, more uh, the, the most common symptom was like a complaint of burning followed by complaint of dry, dryness. So there seems to be some sort of, you know, ocular surface related changes that happens when we look at uh, your Kindle based devices or your uh, digital devices uh, compared to reading a textbook. Because earlier the belief is that uh, there is, there is the, the task is not uh, actually different. Uh, it's basically the viewing angle and the size of the monitor, uh, the illumination uh, that, uh, you know, that's present. So these were the hypotheses that were made earlier. But now it looks like that uh, the mechanisms, like the visual mechanism that drives, like how we actually read uh, from a mobile phone and how we read from a textbook itself seems to be uh, a little bit different in terms of, uh, you know, modulating your ocular surface uh, related uh, changes this study i want to sort of mention about one thing uh, which is uh, you know because there are many studies that talks about the blue light that comes from the smartphones right this is a study that talks about what really happens at the level of corneal epithelial cells um, in terms of the oxidative stress okay when we really look at these uh, smartphone based devices there are a lot of free radicals i mean they give a list of these uh, uh, the the abcds of these radicals but this is a freely accessible paper which you can go and see uh, but what this study found that these inflammatory markers okay uh, these are these are markers that trigger inflammation uh, uh, in the ocular surface and this could be part of inflammatory markers of your overall body also because eye is a part of the body so these inflammatory markers that are released in the tear film uh, is found to be uh, much more higher when people use smartphones compared to uh, you know reading your uh, uh, compared to controls okay uh, so this is quite alarming of course the sample size was just eight in this study and uh, they looked at various markers not just uh, you know one marker they looked at all the sort of reactive oxidation uh, species what they call as ROS which could which could indicate what really happens in your eye when inflammation happens and they sort of uh, uh, take this uh, association and the effect of blue light on the ocular uh, tear surface and stuff like that but this is really alarming i would say because uh, this is a very recent study once again though there is no conclusive evidence that's coming up saying you know yeah blue light is harmful blue light is dangerous but uh, digital devices are definitely doing something in terms of disrupting the ocular surface that is definitely showing up time and again in all the studies now, moving on to, I think, uh, uh, a lot of ocular surface related issues. Now, moving on to, uh, uh, you know, my favorite topic, which is accommodative issues and then neck pain. Okay, so, uh, of course, uh, many of us think that uh, they just uh, they just coexist, okay? Uh, people say it's just because of the viewing angle, because your viewing uh, angle is so very different, automatically you kind of put excessive stress on your neck. And especially if uh, you are a press by your like when we, uh, prescribe uh, these progressive glasses and if the uh, you know if the glasses are if the viewing uh, uh, portion of the the addition if it's not uh, uh, you know 
prescribed properly then people are in the process of adaptation people tend to sort of lose their neck to read and even with bifocals for that matter and all these sorts of adapt adaptation actually leads to neck pain and all the musculoskeletal issues uh, but uh, you know so this study really looked at uh, 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 you know all sorts of association between accommodation and neck pain and what i would really sort of want to talk about is that uh, uh, people who have these whiplash injuries like you know uh, what we call closed uh, uh, contusion concussion injuries when you have an injury at the back of your head okay uh, where even part of your cervical spine is also involved uh, these people have some sort of accommodation issues that is that is proven in many studies and uh, and if we really understand the accommodation pathway, the pupillary pathway, the sympathetic and parasympathetic system, uh, the sympathetic pathway also shares the same pathway as your cervical pathway. So if you remember the uh, seriospinal center of budge, okay, which is between the T3 to T8, where your uh, accommodation, the sympathetic pathway of your accommodation also travels. So, so these studies, these review articles sort of trying to understand uh, that is this just an association? Like, you know, when you see an accommodation problem and a neck pain, is this just an association? Like, you know, they just come together or is it also have some cause-effect relationship? It's not proven yet, but I just want you to remember that any sort of neck discomfort and associated accommodation dysfunction need to be carefully looked at okay and uh, again look at this interesting study i'll just show okay this is a study that uh, showed people with the neck pain and uh, uh, people without neck pain okay so the the gray ones are controls uh, no neck pain the black ones are people with neck pain and look at the visual discomfort okay so so the the uh, if you're not able to see the y axis the x axis i'm sorry they are nothing but you know squinting uh, so eyes blurred vision watering eyes eye pain closed work itching eyes so all sort of visual discomfort is much higher in people who have neck pain they just didn't do anything they just put took people who have neck pain they took people who did not have neck pain and they looked at just the computer vision sort of symptoms so uh, so uh, this is again to stress the importance of uh, musculoskeletal issues because you know being an optometrist i can say like you know we just ask oh do you have neck pain do you have back pain but then it's very important to to have a holistic approach to managing these problems that's what i'm trying to tell you like you know look at the physiotherapist role is important if some sort of neck uh, uh, pain relieving uh, you know process is important for them to have a holistic uh, uh, relief from the digital eye strain okay so i'm going to take one minute break now so i just i'm just imagining that all of you are going to stand up okay so you're going to i'm going to stand up so i don't know how many of you see me but then uh, okay Okay, just stand up a little bit. I'm visualizing that every one of you are standing up. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of do this now. Okay, so what you uh, because we've all been sitting and then uh, listening to my lecture. So the first uh, uh, process. Okay, come on, let the let the animation work. So what we're going to do is uh, what we call is wagging wagging the tail. Okay. This is a Chinese medicine based practice, which we call as Qi Gong, which is to move the energy in your body. So what you're going to do is this. You're just going to kind of uh, like how the dog bags its tail, move just, you know, like a couple of times this side, that side. This is going to sort of, uh, you know, release this all stagnant energy that is there within uh, because you've just joined rushed and then joined for the session and you've been looking at the monitor, staring at the monitor. So as you do, just scan across wherever you are sitting, your room, and then sort of you know, look at, move your eyes and also move your body, okay? Okay, so that's first. The second is what we call shake the tree. So you are the tree. Imagine that you are the tree and then your root is uh, grounded to the mother earth, okay? So just sort of shake it, okay? Just shake yourself. Shake your body for 10 times like this. And once you're done, just sit, okay? So this is the sort of break that I wanted to give you. Of course, I can't do nothing. So... This is the sort of break okay so whenever you feel uh, you feel uh, sort of tensed this has got a lot of other uh, you know somebody left i don't think that they left because of the exercise i'm sorry so uh, this is sort of you know it's it looks very funny from the outside but this sort of uh, moving is is kind of very relaxing for the overall body especially for the spinal cord okay so after i read all 
because we really need to uh, strengthen the spinal cord and the neck a little bit more okay okay so i'm just going to get back to my uh, presentation and uh, uh, so now that we understood that the symptomatology of uh, digital eye strain okay which is uh, vision related uh, and uh, uh you know ocular surface related that's what we said okay so vision related has got your refractive component your binocular vision related component ocular surface related issues has got your dry eye related uh, issues and you also have got your musculoskeletal uh, part okay so we also looked at uh, uh, why why viewing on a digital device is very different from reading on a printed textbook or a paper and uh, ocular surface uh, related issues uh, seems to be really you know uh, uh, coming up dominantly like you know in most of the studies okay so that's the message at this point and uh, now we are we want to assess okay a, a patient now walks into your clinic so what do you really do that's very important for us as optometrists so the very first uh, important thing that we have to do is to uh, first understand their symptoms okay so this is a valid questionnaire which is called as the CVSQ Okay, the computer vision syndrome questionnaire, and so this questionnaire is, uh, 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 you know, I can this questionnaire I can share it if anybody is interested. Just ask. But then this is the questionnaire. Okay, it's just sixteen items, uh, which is basically. Uh, the the questions are like these okay so whatever that we discuss the symptomatology all the questions are listed here so that is what is the uh, is the items okay in the questionnaire so this downloadable but i have a copy if anybody wants to explore please let me know so what we are going to do is that in this questionnaire each of this uh, item is going to be uh, scored for their frequency and for the intensity okay so frequency is how often the symptom is present and intensity is how severe the problem is and then we are going to multiply this the scoring is a little bit tricky but not difficult and i and then finally you come out with the score putting everything together and any score greater than 6 okay is supposed to be uh, you know symptomatic right and so this is a validated questionnaire that i would recommend that people can look at and then there is another questionnaire which is what we call as the cvss 17 okay so these two are the sort of questions that uh, people are using and this question is freely accessible you can go to this link that i have provided here cvss17.com the only thing is of course the the authors of the study are collecting research data also from this questionnaire uh, but nonetheless you can go and take a look at these questions it has again all the sorts of questions that we just discussed and 17 items uh, a maximum score can be 53 and this is available in spanish english and uh, very germany and various other languages also so again uh, this is uh, a questionnaire that can be used to uh, score the level of uh, severity okay the symptom severity now why is it important i would highly recommend like you know as a team we all we are all like in our clinic we discuss uh, that whenever we want to understand uh, whether a patient is make uh, is making Uh, progress with the treatment it's not just important to look at improvement in objective parameters like you assess accommodation you assess tear break up time uh, you know uh, of course you see an improvement but it's also important to understand subjectively if they feel an improvement okay that is very important so this sort of a questionnaire will actually give you it's very easy just share the link to the patient and they're going to fill it and you're going to get the answer okay that is very uh, you know sort of uh, uh, very useful to practitioners these are two questions that are questionnaires that i would rec want to recommend and uh, and this is a review article uh, uh, that i recommend that you should go and read uh, which talks about uh, you know specifically what are the ocular and visual discomfort associated with smartphones tablets and computers and from this paper i take this info infographics okay so in this infographics what we are trying to understand is this okay now look here there is this phone picture that is given and there's the computer picture so the phone picture talks about digital device okay any sort of mobile phone or smartphone and the computer's uh, picture talks about your personal computer okay or laptop and then so this uh, these authors uh, give you uh, uh, you know information about what really happens for each of these parameters what happens to accommodation what happens to virgins and what happens to ocular surface related issues 
specifically with uh, digital device and computers okay so uh, this is a sort of paper that you can go over but what i have borrowed from this paper uh, is this okay which is uh, from this paper as well as from the work by mark rosenfield uh, putting together everything what sort of assessment do we have to do when a patient comes to us so of course the first step is uh, uh, you know giving a questionnaire and understanding the symptomatology the second thing is doing your full workup very important is to get your refraction done properly okay and then your all your accommodation assessment your virgins assessment i'm not going to get into the detail of how you do this process and specifically in computer users what is recommended is that all these testing should be done uh, at the near distance at which the patient works okay that is the only difference mark uh, rosenfield et al specifically recommends that if if i use it at 50 cm okay if i sort of use my digital device at 50 then you don't do your your virgins testing at 40 you basically do your virgins testing at 50 and uh, uh, and also look at uh, fixation disparity and associated phoria i'm not going to uh, uh you know get into this in the previous talk i have explained about how we but uh, uh, all these testing should be done at the distance at which the patient use, uses the electronic screen that is very very important and of course uh, do your dry eye workup and uh, look uh, and then sort of understand uh, the humidity of the environment where the patient works the hydration okay so very important the hydration like the amount of water that the patient drinks uh, any other etiology like any other pathologies that are present and use of contact lens and the whole contact lens workup okay so this is sort of the basic assessment as an optometrist you should be able to uh, do when a, a person with the computer vision syndrome comes into the clinic now you have decided to prescribe uh, progressive addition lenses okay so as i as i said uh, this study uh, specifically looked at lighting requirements and also other uh, ergonomic considerations in people who are using progressive addition lenses but what is really important is that see here the prevalence of computer vision syndrome in people who are using progressive addition lenses is 74 percentage okay and non-neutral neck posture was one of the high risk factor by non-neutral neck posture is that uh, it's not it's not neutral either they're overly flexing or you know they're having some sort of rotation basically and then they found they came out with beautiful uh you know they recommend this uh this website i'll just try to click and then show you but then uh i'll show it at the end uh note this uh this uh, ergonomic vision uh you know link this if you go here this is a this is a uh website for patients basically it gives you what is the first step that you need to do chair table keyboard and light adjustments second step uh, your glasses okay beautiful recommendations about glasses whether you want to use unifocals multifocals uh, occupational glasses progressive addition lenses what sort of glasses is going to help you so it's going to help the patient make informed decisions about what is going to suit them and then the correct monitor position so it's a three step advice tool where uh, it's going to guide the patient step by step first you go and take the take the you know this uh, uh, testing uh, it's not testing basically it's more of a tool and then you will be amazed at the information that you get this is the paper that this article is recommending and uh, you know uh, especially when you are going to prescribe progressives for the first time and then you want to really understand or help the patient understand the technical details of how they have to position their monitor what is going to suit their needs okay so basically you know it should be they give you some recommendations which is uh, approximately the viewing distance should be 75 centimeters and then the upper edge of the monitor okay which is for example if this is my laptop then the upper edge of the monitor should be at least 15 centimeter below the eye level so i'm so short usually i used to put something beneath to sit but of course i'm not uh, in the current ergonomic position now but it should be at least 15 centimeters so that it corresponds to a gaze inclination of at least minus 20 degrees like sort of like this okay so uh, and then uh, which is the center of the screen and so these two are some of the rough recommendations that they make okay and uh, so if you go into this they give you like sort of step-by-step -step recommendations at what needs to be done 
and uh, uh, this is another paper which talks about uh, presbyopic corrections especially the vertical zones of clear vision okay so what sort of recommendations do we have to make especially uh, when uh, when we are prescribing progressives for the first time so what is really important is that you know uh, what sort of progressives we need to prescribe i mean uh, i should admit here that uh, uh, even as optometrists we are not taking enough time to really counsel the patient about the design of progressive lenses that they need to go through though technological advancements have taken us somewhere are on to what we call as this conventional non-free from progressives but then there are these optimized progressives individual progressives and even personalized progressives leave aside the cost factor but if the patient is going to be benefited with any sort of novel design and any sort of tool or technology that you have is going to help the patient choose that sort of a uh, you know uh, a glass that gives them their comfort why not why should we not try that and uh, especially you know if uh, if for example if there is going to be a new presbyop like say uh, say 42 43 year old who just comes and tells you that uh, i have i have to only do like computing uh, all the time like 24 hours say like most of my time is on computing and i use two computers okay now most of us use two computers we use a big monitor and a small monitor like some of the uh, these computing people and all the time i have to only shift between two monitors and then i that's the major of my workload is all about then this patient doesn't need any sort of progressives or bifocals all he needs is a single vision glass that is going to help him uh, look clearly at this intermediate distance wherever he is going to look at uh but if this patient is going to be shifting between uh uh you know a reading material and the monitor then you have to of course go ahead and discuss about uh either an occupational progressives uh or uh, a standard progressive lenses so i think it is important for us to understand the visual demands of the patient and then uh prescribe them with the appropriate lenses and this is low power lenses we also did a study at uh, shankaritraya where we found uh, that some patients especially when they have this visual fatigue they benefit from low power convex addition lenses like the low power i mean in the range of plus 0.25 to plus 0.75 diopters so in this study again uh, people in the age of 20 to 40 like pre presbyopic age group they were prescribed with uh, addition lenses and what they found was that uh, uh, you know the plus 0.75 lenses were preferred by many participants uh, and it also uh, you know reduce the visual fatigue so so what is very important is that if patient has got visual fatigue make sure that they have uh, they don't have any i mean first binocular vision assessment is important and uh, tear film related issues even after that some sort of visual fatigue is present then you should uh, uh, you know you can also try these uh, low power lenses the last recommendation that i want to make here is about uh, uh, the an interesting paper you know we must have uh, studied in low vision about the grandis rule uh, and even there are some other rules which talks about what is the critical print size right they say it should be two times or three times uh, like the size of the reading material uh, it should be two times or three times compared to the threshold visual acuity so this study especially for computer users they recommend that two times right okay so this is the uh, reading speed that they assist and between 2x and 3x magnification no difference was found of course they changed the magnification by changing the doing distance so what does this mean is that for example if you see a subject who has like 6x visual acuity okay at near and uh, uh, then uh, the uh, the font size that you're going to be using on the screen should be at least 612 and above okay so it should be two times that of the uh, the threshold print size the threshold visual acuity that you have measured okay and that can actually be uh, beneficial in terms of reducing visual fatigue coming to the last i'm not the expert in this uh, but there are a lot of studies i mean there are two major studies that came out which speaks about the short wearing blue light glasses and uh, but uh, but what i want to make a point here is that yes the smartphones are uh, because of the led displays uh, they exhibit, they emit these blue light which can definitely you know uh, sort of uh, Uh, disturb your sleep your circadian rhythms uh, but what is the effect of these blue light filtering glasses on you know your computer vision syndrome or in terms of uh, 
in terms of relieving the symptoms okay of course uh, as we just discussed about uh, uh, you know the, the the lack of standard practice patterns this is a, a beautiful study done by one of our own alum named uh, dr sumi singh who is currently pursuing his doctorate research at uh, australia so where uh, currently there is no conclusive evidence of course you know uh, some practitioners want to prescribe some practitioners don't want to prescribe so what is the standard what is the stand that we have to take now at this moment is that we do not have any sort of uh, 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 you know a concrete evidence to believe that uh, these blue cut filters or these blue light blocking lenses are uh, really beneficial no Though I make this statement, keep this in mind uh, that there are people who have sleep uh, disturbances. Okay, there are people who uh, specifically have a lot of anxiety-related issues. So even in the radiology world, there was an RCT that was done, uh, especially with blue cut filters in a very small sample size, and some of the radiologists uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, they they felt that the visual fatigue was much lesser. So it's it's I think it's more of a uh, more of an individual subject experience but in terms of really a concrete evidence that is available in the vision science world there is nothing at this moment okay but what is really important is to have good sleep hygiene and make sure that you stay away from your devices at least 1 to 2 hours before you sleep okay and uh, of course taking care of your musculoskeletal issues and i'm going to ask you a question now okay how many of you all of us tell this to patients like you know i'm going to finish my talk so all of us are, are telling this to patients 2020 20 now type in the chat box who gave the 2020 20 rule okay so whatever you know about the 2020 20 rule just type in the chat box and i will give you the answer as uh, who gave the 20 rule like okay so i'll just uh, i'll sort of look into the chat box to see like how many of you are answering um so i think i'm getting the answer here so yes you're right okay so dr jeff anshel it's very very surprising friends actually you know uh, so this is a this is a, a sort of a, a, a write up that came uh, this is okay this is the dr jeff anshel that we are talking about uh, he published this okay visual ergonomics in the workplace so he said uh, in 1991 he came up with the 2020 20 rule idea because he was just you know he was handling the people in the corporate world and he was thinking of some simple strategy to relieve computer vision related stress okay and he didn't uh, unfortunately trademark or copyright this concept but he says that as long as it is uh, useful to the optometry world i'm happy and that's why that's when all the optometrists across the globe started to use the concept 2020 20 so make sure that you uh, you know you honor this person or you give credit to this person by citing him next time whenever you use 2020 20 okay and uh, uh, so that's the that's the 2020 20 quiz and of course you are simple i cannot uh, over emphasize this whole thing about stretching uh, but the last a uh, bit of advice or rather uh, you know in the pediatric population especially based on our own evidence uh, we see that smartphone use definitely is a sort of risk factor for pediatric dry eye disease but i'm not put, i'm not put this paper for that uh, message uh, this is a message that we need to take to parents because uh, the children who had uh, issues who had their ocular surface uh, uh drives the scores uh high before smartphone usage tbut scores lesser before smartphone usage punctate epithelial erosions after discontinuing smartphone for 2 weeks discontinuing in the sense yes they reduced hours of use some kids stopped it almost every child became normal so the earlier you pick up these issues and uh, cutting down screen time has a very very positive impact okay this is a study large scale study about 916 children were included in the study and cessation of smartphone does seem to be very very protective against kids developing dry eye disease and related visual issues okay so this is the a b c d e that we speak about awareness frequent breaks cutting down gadgets diet and hydration exercise and family time okay a b c d e f 
and uh, uh, this is something that I was very passionate about, but I don't have time to discuss. But go and explore more. And if some of you want to take it as a study, also please do it because unfortunately, this is a study that came in uh, 2020 only, where yoga exercises has shows really a great effect on eye fatigue scores. Okay, these are conservative management, especially they talk about this being a therapeutic and non-pharmacologic intervention for asthenopia and uh, uh, and. Uh, 32 undergrad optometry students were the study population. So it's biased in a sense. But even then, it's time that we explore. And of course, this was a very early study that came, uh, that was published by Shirley Tillis et al., where uh, yoga does seem to be working on uh, self related visual discomfort in dry eyes. Okay, a large uh, sample size based study where yoga did show a lot of improvement. And uh, and uh, beyond vision okay beyond vision there is something that's coming up off late we must be uh, this is more of a social accountability stuff that we have to keep in mind that uh, we are all only looking at the eyes, but then uh, there is also what we call as video game addiction that's coming up so this paper looked at uh, visual issues and addiction based uh, issues okay and they say that uh, though some of us argue that video games have a cognitive benefit it improves your uh, brain function and stuff like that it is important that uh, we understand the the risks of uh, excessive video gaming and uh, you know smartphone use especially the adolescent age group okay this one is the <laughs> it's a very interesting study where you don't have to do anything Okay, you don't have to do any assessment. If you just want to know whether you are at risk of computer vision syndrome, look at this. So if you are senior, okay, so the higher your age is, the more you use uh, computers at uh, uh, work. And if you uh, if you are already having previous history of refractive surgery, if you're doing night shifts, the percentage of uh, risk for computer vision syndrome is this. So this is a paper that kind of you know, uh, spoke about people who've undergone refractive surgery, contact lens use, any sort of ocular surgery. If you work in the geriatric department, because your EMR use is more uh, if you work in the geriatric department, it seems. So this is basically on health professionals. So the reason why I chose this study is that in healthcare professionals, okay? So because I'm talking about this now, I'm going to share the results from our what we did uh, the survey that we did shortly okay so with that uh, i'm going to be i'm going to be thanking everybody uh, here especially the uh, uh, oils team uh, mr fakhruddin and uh, i have yeah i have few people here so mr praveen because he is called the infographics person okay so he has helped me with a lot of these uh, uh, beautiful uh, infographics that came here and there uh, and Sumir who provided me with all the blue light stuff and my beautiful team that you see here so acknowledgement goes to all of these people and uh, please share your learning in the chat box as I'm just going to compile uh, you know the results from the survey that we did just before and uh, if you want to connect with me through any of these please feel free to connect and digital eye strain related uh, YouTube links are available here so we've just these are all especially for public uh, where we've released uh, one podcast and one uh, youtube uh, uh, link which is available apparently in uh, tamil english and even bengali so our bengali uh, our SN kolkata optoms uh, have even done it in bengali so uh, so i'll share those links and you can uh, you know take a look at those links i'll keep taking questions uh, when i just sort of compile this uh, okay thank you thank you ma'am uh, okay so okay. It looks like yeah, my, I mean, Aishwarya has just done a brilliant job. So look at this. This is your profile, guys. Whoever came in first, I think you sort of managed to um, do this. And uh, yes, large percentage of students. And uh, look at this here. So looks like uh, a large percentage of you use somewhere between four to eight hours. Okay. That's your, your near work percentage. And number of gadgets used. Interesting. Look here. 33.3% uh, percentage use three gadgets, okay, and 44.7% percentage of us use two gadgets. So most of us use at least two to three gadgets, okay. Uh, there is a small percentage that use more than four gadgets, okay. Yes, uh, spectacle 
Optometrine is used by 62.1 percentage of optometry uh, professionals in this current uh, uh, delegate list. And 50 who are here, we have occasional neck pain. Okay, so now you can understand how important it is. And 43.9 percentage of us have back pain. Okay. 53% of us have asthenopic symptoms like blurred vision, headache, and eye strain. 40.2% of us have some sort of dry eye related issues. And 88% of us take frequent breaks. That's so good. And uh, yes, 34% of you seems to be using some sort of specific glasses for computer use. That includes anti-fatigue blue blocking glasses. OK, I would be interested to really understand how it helps you. Uh, but thank you for providing that information. And have you ever got a computer vision syndrome workup done? Honestly, I joined here. 72% of us have never got a DES workup done. And that's our demographics. And now this tells us the sort of self-care that we as optometrists have given to our own self. So make sure, let's make sure that over the next week, we sort of go and get our and see how our uh, visual fatigue, especially, you know, this, this blurred vision related issues. And Thank you so much. I think uh, we, we have questions, but I'm very excited also, as, as you said, to see the results of the survey which we have done within this one hour and it, it truly tells us that as optometrists we also need to be careful about what's happening and we also need to take care about you know managing all those uh, problems uh, importantly in this scenario so thank you ma'am so we have the first question which is uh, when you mentioned about assessing uh, you know the patients at the working distance uh, but the problem is the normative value what we have is at you know 40 centimeters most of the test normative values so how do we yeah. usually compare it so is there any take on that ma'am okay so that's a that's a both uh, i would say an intelligent uh, uh, question as well as uh, uh, something that something that sort of demands uh, more work in this area so so what is the current understanding that we have is of course values at 40 centimeters and values at uh, uh, you know apparently uh, six meters we don't have normative values uh, for uh, for intermediate distance which is 50 centimeters but what we can rather do at this moment is just to uh, use the 40 centimeter cutoff and then just relate it Okay, for example, if the 40 centimeter cutoff says that anything above six exophoria is abnormal, then maybe you should sort of, uh, this Rosenfield's paper just talks about, uh, you know, cutoffs for exophoria and fixation disparity. So I can share those values. Uh, and then look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, look at if, uh, uh, if these cutoffs are not met. The, the second important thing is qualitative assessment, which is uh, if you look at the accommodation test that we shared, which is your uh, negative and positive relative accommodation and facility, uh, more than the cutoff, what is important is the difficulty that the patient is facing. So at 50 centimeter, when I perform these tests, that patient has difficulty on one side compared to the other side, then I know that they have problem either in stimulating accommodation or relaxing accommodation. So it's uh, for now, yes, it's important to look at the qualitative aspects of the ice tray, but yes, some, some work need to be done. Yes. Okay. Okay. So the next question is, are there, uh, are there any visual exercises effective in reducing the adverse effects of the DES as well as the CVS, computer vision syndrome? OK, so thanks for that question again. So as I said, uh, when you say visual exercises, currently what we call is vision therapy. So if there is a binocular vision problem, like any sort of convergence issues or accommodation issues that are present, then vision therapy has shown to be uh, efficacious in uh, improving these symptoms. Yes. Uh, so if so any sort of convergence accommodation issues, standard vision therapy can be definitely used. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Uh, 
what do you feel uh, about the micro fluctuations of the accommodation could that be the main culprit for the des okay thanks uh, saurav for that question so we did uh, we did explore this a bit actually and uh, <clears throat> So for the participants, what are accommodative micro fluctuations? So accommodative micro fluctuations are nothing but uh, uh, the sort of uh, finer changes in your accommodative system that is happening, which is which cannot be clinically measured. So you need to have, for example, when I am just looking at this monitor, like within a second, how my okay. Uh, Okay, uh, so we have some tools like the open field auto refractor and power refractors that we used to measure accommodative micro fluctuations in computer users and uh, 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 and the and we did in the in the pilot study that we did we did not find any difference between uh, uh, people who have digitalized strain versus people who did not have uh, but. The, the low plus lenses study, like whichever study that is talking about the low plus lenses, uh, uh, and especially the ones that also use the critical flicker frequency measurements uh, in digitalized string, they use accommodative micro fluctuations or they show accommodative micro fluctuations to be uh, present in uh, people who have digitalized string. Okay. But I wouldn't call it. I wouldn't call it the main culprit, Saurav. Main culprit. Okay. It may be uh, plays a role, but not the main culprit. Not yeah. the main culprit, yeah. Yeah. And the next question is about visual comfort for patients uh, in the age group of 35 to 40 years old. Uh, what could we do to increase their visual comfort? Could we give them a plus 0.5 diopter glasses uh, with a blue cut or a blue coat, I guess, uh, what that means, or anti-reflective okay. coating? Okay, uh, so I'll just take the first part of the question, which is 35 to 40, which is the pre-presbyopic age group. Uh, right. Uh, so, of course, when they have got the first thing to rule out is latent hyperopia, right? So you have to make sure there's no latent hyperopia component and uh, they have, you know, uh, uh, their visual equity as such is all perfect and they're emotropic. The second aspect to, to, the, uh, to the question is that, uh, uh, yes, of course, when they have got uh, uh, visual fatigue, uh, the low, pl low plus lenses in the range of plus 0.5, plus 0.7 is from a very, very long time period. I mean, it, it, I think we can trace it back to even early 1950s or 60s where this concept of near point stress was in, was introduced by Skeffington. And uh, so the low plus lenses have been used very much in the optometric literature and uh, people, uh, subjects have shown really improvements. And even in our practice, uh, when we prescribe these low plus lenses, some of these people immediately show an improvement uh, in the visual fatigue. They say, I, this is really comfortable for me. So yes, so if those low plus lenses are giving the increased comfort, please go ahead, nothing should stop you. Now coming to ARC, yes, of course, ARC, but blue cut, as I told you, we we do not currently have an evidence as such that you know we should be doing a blue filter or a blue cut filter incorporated into the prescription. I don't have an answer at that moment for the blue cut part of it, Saurav. So that should. Okay, okay, ma'am. Uh, the next question is about the future of uh, Google Glasses because it's uh, understand it is for the one eye. So any experience or any uh, takes on that? Oh yeah. I've not uh, tried, uh, Dr. Kika, I've not tried the Google Glasses yet. It pays our devices, and uh, there's one study which I did not put here. Uh, they looked at uh, digitalized string due to virtual reality based devices, but this study did not really show any, um, any change in accommodation and virgins parameters. But Google Glasses, yes, definitely we need to explore. Uh, especially if it is for one night, then we need to look at what sort of binocular adjustments do we have to make, how how we are able to adapt to these, uh, this perception that we are doing with these Google Glasses. Uh, I think it's, uh, we should explore first and then, and then see. Uh, but thanks for asking that question. I will keep that as something that I will have to read. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the next question is... Uh... What could be the relation of neck pain and accommodation? Okay. According to, uh, according so to as I, 
right so uh, so all all sort of information that i presented is of course compiled from every literature uh, that is present in the world of digital eye strain so if you really see that uh, the first thing is of course uh, there is already a neck pain which is nothing to do with your ocular accommodation there is a neck pain and there is also an accommodative issue both of them are present together which is like you know an association the second is that you have some sort of um, you know uh, uh uh adaptation issues with your progressive glasses especially in the pre presbyopic and the presbyopic age group when we are trying to put them on with near addition they try to make changes like extensive uh changes flexion and extension and rotation to the neck and that can sort of result in uh, both neck pain as well as accommodative uh, um, you know increased accommodative effort and then there is a third component which is uh, where neck is the reason for accommodative issue where when you have a cervical problem uh, then you know the accommodation pathway the sympathetic pathway the longest pathway sort which runs through the cervical and the thoracic area before it goes to the ciliary ganglion and so this uh, uh, this sympathetic pathway also it seems to be uh, involved uh, uh which goes through the cervical uh, you know zone it seems to be also affecting the accommodation so uh, as an optometrist i think our role is this mainly we have to first ask uh, if the neck pain started specifically after you we prescribe these progressive glasses then you have an answer or if they say i have a neck pain after a certain sort of injury uh or especially these ergonomic considerations also and like you know improper viewing angle uh, uh uh you know height of the monitor issues so we need to work from a very holistic picture that's what i should say yeah yeah and other than the 2020 20 uh, rule or you know the the advice what we give to our patient can you tell us about any other exercises which is specific for CVS and DES? Um, so any other exercise, of course, frequent breaks because uh, uh, because some some of these studies that looked at the visual fatigue, uh, 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 you know, how it changes with various sorts of intervention. Uh, taking frequent breaks at least if to be really working uh, well in terms of reducing the strain. Uh, so apart from the 2020 rule, which is of course uh, a short of a quick break, uh, uh, having frequent breaks and then uh, you know ensuring that the uh, frequent blinking or conscious blinking full blinking okay so conscious full blinking uh, uh, when we view these monitors uh, these are all some of the conservative management can do uh, like your uh, that's what we're doing in our accommodation system uh, incorporating those uh, uh, vision therapy exercises will also help yeah and uh, what's your take on uh, the Again, it's about blue block lenses. I think uh, you have covered that well, that there is no, not much of an evidence. But what about the phones? What currently nowadays right. it comes with the blue blue block and you know the night mode and all that. So any experience on that, would that help? Right, of course, we again need more evidences to show that what part of the, the spectrum is uh, is cut off. Okay, so we are talking about, I think, this 400 to 500 uh, nanometers range, basically, uh, uh, because of the short wavelength nature of these this blue light, they also have really very high energy. And that is when they, they tend to disrupt the, uh, the process of circadian rhythm by interfering with your melatonin uh, levels. And uh, so the filter that comes along with the smartphone, the night modes, uh, I think some of the smartphones do have a sort of uh, a gradient system where uh, it's not uh, it's not too warm. Because what study says that is more than the, or rather along with these filters, the brightness on the monitor is also very important. If you keep your monitor like full bright, switch off your light and then keep putting your phone like that, 
uh, that brightness, brightness is also going to interfere with your circadian rhythm. So mod, mod, uh, moderating or modulating your brightness of the monitor along with those uh, night mode uh, does seem to be, uh, you know, working well with sleep uh, disorders, especially. Uh, but what happens to the eye, uh, you know, how does your intrinsic uh, photoreceptors, your uh, yeah. retinal ganglion cells behave? All those definitely we need more evidence. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. A couple of questions will take more. Uh, in terms of DES, is there any advantage whether we should use a laptop or a desktop or, you know, Smartphone. I think you got mentioned that uh, you know there was one study which said that desktop user has less complaints compared to laptop users. So any any comments on that? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. It brings in a very important point about uh, some of the recommendations that we are making uh, to children, especially who are at risk for myopia, onset and progression, especially. Uh, so if you look at these recommendations, some some studies that uh, says that uh, as the size of the monitor reduces, uh, then apparently, you know, you have to make more effort or as another person has asked here, it, you, you take it very close. Automatically, you take it closer. And this is sort of, uh, you know, uh, triggers. It triggers this whole vicious cycle of uh, increased accommodation and then this whole, uh, you know, uh, near induced uh, responses that triggers. So definitely, yes, uh, based on the current studies, I think uh, we should you we should recommend uh, to uh, use larger screen size as much as possible, uh, especially a laptop is preferred over a smartphone. Uh, a desktop computer is preferred over a laptop uh, 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 in terms of reducing the visual fatigue. Yes. Yeah. Somebody just commented that maybe possibly use a smart TV. So yes. again, yeah. Yes. If For you have the facility, clearance. yes. Yeah. Yes. Because smart TV gives you the advantage of increased distance also. So you come back really far and then you sit and uh, watch. I think China has made it a policy. Uh, Post-COVID, uh, I think they've given some recommendations. If you really look at those pay from the Southeast Asia, China especially, children watch the school programs on a smart TV. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, we'll take one last question. There are a lot of questions coming up, but uh, I think we'll answer it in some other way. But this one last question is about uh, there is a case of about eight years old who is high myopic and he's using five to six hours of mobile due to online teaching. So, as an optometrist, what do you think we should be, uh, you know, suggesting these kind of patients or kids coming to our practice? Okay, thanks uh, for that question, uh, uh, Sashwini. So the the first thought is to understand, uh, do a risk profile. Okay, so what, so I, I'll just quickly give you a gist of the myopia workup, the myopia profiling that we need to do for the child first. So uh, you have to first do the risk profiling for this child, beginning from asking about parental history, uh, whether this child was an uh, developed myopia early onset, like before 12 years of age, uh, and then uh, and then the near work profile. Okay, so there are standard uh, questionnaires, the Sydney myopia questionnaire, for example, that are available where you can look at the near work profile of this kid. So you have to first look at the risk profile of this child, whether this child is at risk for myopia progression, uh, and what sort of risk are we dealing with. And uh, that will give you a very good perspective as a practitioner, uh, and also to counsel the parent. And the second thing is, see, this online teaching we don't have an escape at this moment so it's better that we don't scare the parent but rather we give a sort of recommendations in terms of visual hygiene so if you go to those those youtube links uh, we sort of provide recommendations to general public in terms of outdoor activities uh, you know bringing in some at least one to two hours of outdoor activities frequent breaks and some schools, I guess, nowadays, they don't do classes for more than four hours. Uh, many schools in Chennai have taken that stand, I guess. I think all the CBSC schools have taken that stand now. Uh, so I think it's very important to sort of, uh, uh, you know, do this advocacy for this message, which is uh, providing frequent breaks. And uh, just, just now we discussed using large screens, not small okay. screens, but larger screens for educational activities. Um, and uh, of course, having your frequent examination done. Look at the profile, like how the child has progressed before and the child, how the child, uh, you know, what is the progression pattern? Uh, and then follow up frequently. 
if there is a progression if there is a uh, more than half a diopter progression over the last one year then think of myopia control strategies uh, and that includes both pharmacologic and non pharmacologic managements yeah okay i think we have covered up almost all the question related to the topic for today and uh, there were some question related to the dry eye and uh, scleral lenses whether they can be prescribed and uh, since uh, des is associated very closely to dry eye how would you assess uh, especially in kids because now of the covid 19 so a lot of things about dry eye are coming up so we do have a session tomorrow so i didn't ask you that question as of yet because we have a dry eye Thank session you. tomorrow so i'll keep that i'll keep that for for the later <laughs> stage but if you want to add on if there's anything you would you would want to add on on your experience on dry eye see i am not a dry eye expert so definitely if a dry eye expert is coming in i would uh, i would leave uh, it to that person but being a primary care optometrist i guess uh, any child who has dryness related symptoms assess their uh, blinking uh, the you know how many times they are blinking in a minute like actually count the number of blinks that they are making which is supposed to be somewhere in the range of 12 to 18 times at least and then uh, uh, uh and then do the tear break up time which is the non invasive break up time as well as the uh, you know the invasive break up time and then doing your shermers if there are punctate epithelial erosions like in that study if you are picking up then it is important to look at the corneal and conjunctival staining also uh, just to make sure that after you provide these recommendations how things are changing but uh, doing a tear break up time i think is the bare minimum that you can do to understand how the the blinking integrity how much is that yeah 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 so thank you i think ma'am we have taken almost all the questions uh, i don't see any new questions so i guess thank you very much uh, dr rizwana for taking up this and uh, we had a wonderful learning time and learned a lot of new things probably some things which we already knew but uh, you know these are very important but most of the things what you shared were really really interesting thank you so much thanks patrudin for all the support that you provided and for your patient waiting um, you know to get this session organized uh, and yeah. i really uh, yeah i really just want to give one last message to all the people out here that uh, uh, we have a huge role definitely in managing this this sort of uh, what i would call the digital eye strain pandemic uh, that could come uh any that that is it. that is you know that you can see after the post covid 19 so be prepared with your skill set uh and uh, and then do a more holistic job of uh, listening to the patient taking care of them in every possible way providing simple solutions uh and then preparing educational materials and circulating it to parents and all the concerned stakeholders so do whatever that is possible uh, from your end to raise awareness about uh, the sort of digital uh, eye strain issues that we are seeing currently and thank you for all your time uh, you know for just patiently listening to the this long lecture thanks thank you all once again thank you so much i i only thought that myopia is something which you are waiting for and you know uh, now is digital eye strain era so it's it's like we we as optometrists have a very major role to play as you mentioned so Uh, we have to keep up on you know we have to be on our toes i would say is not only myopia is now digital eye strain associated plus the myopia so it's 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 going to be a lot of work for us as optometrists and clinicians for sure and all of you the moment you get back from here monday morning go get your serious work up done <laughs> yes 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 then get your serious work up done and see because uh yeah that that's the whole thing uh, uh, that's my last take message because you mentioned that uh, you know everybody is on their uh, screens and this is our 47th session it's been so long and thank you for uh, you know inventing or i would use the word introducing us to that exercise uh, you know we 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 never did that <laughs> this is this is after the 47 sessions we got to know that yes we forgot that we were we were actually meeting waiting uh, you know making our attendees sit there for one hour listening to the talks but nobody did that so thank you so much dr iswana for doing that yeah thanks thanks for doing and thank you everybody yeah as des is associated with dry eye so we got somebody to talk on dry eye and you know how to get started so please tune in tomorrow uh, it's almost the same time 6:30 evening indian time and 9 uh, late evening malaysian time 
and uh, the speaker is going to talk to us about the practical side of dry eye management and how to get started into our clinical practice so uh, see you all again tomorrow stay home stay safe and take care thank you rizwana ma'am and uh, signing off bye 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 thank you bye, bye.